Hello and welcome again to our daily Bible study, uh, currently going through the Gospel according to John. We're going to start in chapter 3 and verse 1, and we're going to stop right before one of the most famous verses in the entire Bible. We'll come back to that again tomorrow, but let's pray for now. Uh, loving God, um, you are a surprising God, and you uh, sometimes give us puzzles that we have to wrestle with and try to understand. Uh, Lord, in the midst of all of that, let us not forget what you've called us to and help us to navigate those things well. Um, so we can understand you and so we can share you with other people and so that the, the glorious things that you have put before us uh, can be understood by us and our neighbors. Uh, Lord, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon us. Uh, Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so the reason why I'm going to stop right before the famous verse here is because there's one verse in particular that draws on what, in my opinion, is just about the weirdest thing in the entire Old Testament. And I'll explain what I mean here in a minute. But it's picking up in chapter 3, starting in verse 1. It says, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you do not hear the sound of it. Or you do hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it's coming from and where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus says, how can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things you would, uh, and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will have in, in him have eternal life. So there are several things going on here. First of all, I want to draw attention to the fact. Here's just a linguistic, biblical fact that people may, sometimes don't realize. Um, there, there are a lot of Christian groups that get a lot of mileage out of the phrase of being born again. To the point where um, if you don't, that it's almost like if you don't talk in terms of being born again, they sometimes wonder, can you even be a Christian? I just want to point out the fact that the only time in the Bible that this idea of being born again occurs at all is in this passage. Um, th there's no other place in the entire New Testament where the idea of being a Christian is described as being born again. Now, that's not to say we can't use it, and it's not to say that there's not an important role for it. Um, but to become obsessed with that as, a, as the primary way of thinking about what it means to be a Christian is simply not doing justice to the length and breadth of the Christian testimony in the New Testament. Um, so, uh, so you oftentimes don't hear me talk about being born again, and that's partially because this is the only place in the Bible we see it, and partially because uh, what Jesus is doing here is actually very interesting, because he asks the question about uh, being born again. Now, the interesting thing is, this is true in English as well, but sometimes you have words that have more than one meaning. And uh, in Greek, this word that gets translated here as born again could also mean from above, to be born from above. And, and it's interesting because um, uh, it's possible you know, that, uh, that in fact Jesus is trying to say, um, no, unless one is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Uh, and it's possible that Nicodemus is misunderstanding that by saying, well, how, how can you be born again? Um, and that would be a wordplay thing that is just not available in English because in order to make sense of it at all, if, if we translate it the first time as being uh, born from above and then he says, how can I be born again? It would be totally unclear what's going on. So we have to translate the first part as being born, um, you know, born again. But so what that means, we miss the any kind of, if there is indeed Greek wordplay going on here, uh, it does not translate into English. Now, again, I don't want to get people confused about you know, original languages. We're, we're, our modern English translations are really, really good. You know, so I don't want that to be a question that bothers anybody. You know, but there are just moments here and there where um, knowing, for example, that word that gets translated as again, it can also mean from above, uh, may be what, an additional layer of what's going on here. Um, there's all this idea about being the son of a person or an idea and all the rest, this idea of who are you following? Who is it that your, your behavior shows your ancestry of? Um, and so that, that is a, another question. So what might be in the background of all of this? So Nicodemus is a Pharisee. Um, he's the very rare thing we read about in the Gospels. He is a Pharisee that understands who Jesus is or seeks out Jesus. We will see him again. Uh, he will, in his own way, bear witness to who Jesus is in, a, in opposition to the status quo, in opposition to the prevailing leadership at the time. And he will um, at least suffer ridicule for it, if nothing else. 
Uh, he comes at night, you know, perhaps so he can't, so he won't be seen. Um, but the thing I really want to draw attention to, because it's bizarre, is that he says here in verse 14, Jesus says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, if you haven't read the book of Numbers, you might not know what he's referring to. But he is referring to what is, in my opinion, the weirdest thing in the whole Old Testament. You probably are aware of the fact that in the Ten Commandments, God explicitly says, do not create any graven images. So it's, it's interesting because he doesn't just say any idols. He says, don't make images don't make uh, of animals that crawl in the air, fly in the air, you know, or crawl on the ground, fly in the air, or anything like that. And so this idea of to make animals out of bronze, out of metals and stone, all the rest, is simply prohibited. You know, there is to be none of that at all. Um, the, the obvious point is against idolatry, but, there's, but it seems to almost be like if you make them, you're going to turn them into idols, so just don't even make them. The reason why it's so interesting is because at one point in, in the book of Numbers, which is which it's called Numbers, but it really the original name had more to do with wanderings, which is more accurate to what's in the book. And you have the people are wandering between being led out of Egypt, but before they really move into the promised land. And in doing so, they are having all these different kinds of troubles. And in those troubles, um, you get uh, uh, they, they're, God sends punishments, and then there's response to it. And so one of the punishments is that God sends a bunch of poisonous snakes. And people are being bit by these snakes, and they're starting to die and suffer. And so what Moses does at the order of God is he creates a serpent out of bronze and then lifts it up on a pole and the instructions for the people are to lift your eyes up and gaze upon the bronze serpent and then you'll be healed. And they do it. And this is like a big deal. But it seems bizarre to me because this is the same God who said, don't even create any animals out of these things. And we get the impression that down the line that actually they had kept that bronze serpent and it actually had become an issue of idolatry and something like exactly what God said would be the case. And yet here is Jesus drawing on that image to say, as the serpent was lifted up, so the Son of Man has to be lifted up. And so today we would look at that and say, Jesus is talking about his crucifixion because he has to be lifted up on this, on this, to be honest, you know, cross piece. So we can see the connection now. But the fact of the matter is this is, the, this is without a doubt the most pagan sounding thing we get in the entire Bible is a story about the bronze serpent. And I got to be honest, every time I talk about this or I talk about the, the text is coming from or whatever, I, I feel like I have to bring it up because it's so weird. But I don't really know that I understand how to make good sense of it. Um, but the fact of the matter is even in this weirdness, you know, here's God at work in ways that we didn't expect. And, and so I think it's just perhaps, perhaps what we need to do is be aware of one more example of why we cannot put God into a little box uh, and we imagine that we understand how God works because you know we, we've set up the boundaries for it. Because God can break through God's own boundaries, it seems. Um, so this is the, ch- the challenge: is you know what is it? You know what has God done in your life that when you look back on it, you say well, that's a little weird. But how has God used that as a way to point you to Jesus? Because I think we see some of that. Um, we're going to come back again uh, tomorrow and finish it this week, and we're going to come to one of the most famous pa- uh, verses in the entire Bible, certainly one of the most famous passages in, in the Gospel of John. So come back in tomorrow, and we'll finish that week up. Have a good day.